Oh yeah, you see now, Mike. That's anticipation now. Yeah. Now you wait for everybody to, uh, you know, they wait. come on. Everybody comes on. <laughs> that is a nice jacket you have there. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Now I have to just control my eating, so I make sure it fits for uh, quite a bit of time. <laughs> Give everybody some time to uh, look at their phones. Oh my God, what's Milan Weekly Podcast doing on a Wednesday? It's hot huh? in Canada, ladies and gentlemen. It's hot, 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 hot. Oh, we have someone here. Hello, Frank. Sir, yes, sir. Did yeah. You, did you do the dishes tonight, Steve? Or? Tonight? Yeah. I know. Tonight I got away with it. Yeah. I, was, I was stuck outside. Me too. I <laughs> yeah. Yes, Facebook Frank. He knows I have the 120 Milan on. You know why? I'm going to explain to you why I have the 120 Milan on. Hot in Canada. Yes, Larry. Hot in Canada, my friend. Hot. 20, more than 20. Today we hit uh, 33, 34. Mucho caliente, Larry. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get started. Cari amici sportivi, welcome to a special uh, Milan weekly podcast where uh, we surprise all our listeners when we go live via YouTube and uh, via Facebook Live. Yes, uh, Milan Weekly Podcast has entered into the 2020th century, and uh, we're trying to get uh, more of these podcasts out to you. We've had a slew of special guests, and uh, here yet again, I have a pleasure, my pleasure, to uh, welcome Mike Vitulano from Soccer Quebec here to Milan Weekly Podcast. And Mike, I'm going to give him a special introduction. He ha he's going to talk about his accolades, guys. I I'm not going to go into that. But look what Mike has behind him, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. Absolutely. It it's the Opel jersey, the root of Milan, the foundation of Milan, that Opel Opel looks. And you, you, you picture them waving that Champions League trophy, Mike. Yeah. Mike is a Milanista. We've had a lot of guests on, not Milanist. We had the Romanista the other time, Mike's co co-worker. Uh, we're not going to mention him now because it's Mike's time to shine, but the, Mike knows what's going on, so they're, they're battling Battle of the Podcast. So, Mike, welcome to uh, Milan Weekly Podcast. It's really a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me, Steve. This is great, man. I can't wait. So, Mike, we're gonna. We're, everybody knows that we're really loose here. So, you know, yeah. I want you to tell people uh, about Mike Vitulano and uh, and uh, just uh, your your progression to where you've you've reached today as uh, uh, at Soccer Quebec. Yeah. So, you know, like like most of us, I started as a player. I played practically my whole life in RDP. So, uh, born and born and raised. Yeah. My dad bought a house in in '83, right on uh, Philip Panetta in RDP, and. From then on, uh, I played for the club as, as, as of the age of four under uh, Miguel Fakin, everybody knows. And uh, from then on, 18 years old, roughly 18 years old, I, I got an opportunity to play with uh, Les Conquérants de Laval and then the Dynamites, which was a semi-pro team. And from the Dynamites, I guess, you know, as a, as a rookie player, I kind of impressed, I guess. And I, got a, I actually got a shot at 19 years old to, to join the Montreal Impact uh, training camp. And, and Nick DeSantis was the coach back then. And... You know, guys like Rocco and, and them were, were all on the squad. And I um, I had a decent camp. And during camp, I just – one guy comes comes up to me a few months in. He comes up to me after a session. I didn't know him, a Polish guy called Radek. He comes up to me and says, hey, how old are you? And I was 20 years old at, at the time. And he's like uh, 19, 20. He's like, uh, are you interested in going for a scholarship? And it's always something I wanted to do, you know, try to go to university. You know, I was in school back then. I was at Concordia University after uh, Maisonneuve. And – I said, yeah, why not? He says, okay, next week, come to New Hampshire, Division II school, one of the top Division II schools in the, and there's, uh, in the country, and there's a, there's a possibility for you to get a full ride. Why not? What do I have to lose? So I, I go home excited. I tell my parents. Obviously, my mom is like, eh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so because if you get the scholarship, you're not going. Well, I'm like, okay, mom, I'm 20 years old. <laughs> and yeah. uh, 
look, the rest is history in terms of the scholarship. I, I went in and a couple of, uh, you know, one session in and I was offered a full ride, um, ended up being captain of the team uh, as of my second year national championship. And that's where I kind of started getting into coaching, to be honest. Uh, the whole coaching thing came from uh, an injury, believe it or not. My second year, first day of preseason, I something happens as I, as I get up from a tackle and my knee kind of buckles a little bit. And you know the way it is in U.S., MRI right away. I'm, I'm in the hospital. I'm getting an MRI and the doctor tells me, mm, they're, they're, they're fairly short seasons in the U.S., right, for university. And they're like, chances you, you played again this season is, is slim to none. And man, it put things in perspective for me. So I... I, I kind of, I was, I was a bit of a leader on the team. So, you know, captain and everything. So I asked the coach, can I be around the, the group? Can I, and uh, a friend of mine told me, uh, which is a good friend of mine still up to today. He's like, you know, Mike, everything happens for a reason. And just, just try to get better. And by October 15th, I remember like it was yesterday against Merrimack University. I end up, um, I end up playing. I end up playing with a massive knee brace. It was bigger than, uh, <laughs> bigger than my, uh, my bag, but, uh, I ended up playing, and but those those three those three or four weeks, or actually, actually I should say six or eight weeks prior to that game, I was on the bench with the team. I was encouraging guys. I was, you know, I was doing everything I had to do as a good teammate. Even some of my teammates were impressed. They weren't getting any minutes. I didn't have any minutes, obviously, because of the injury. But they're like, "Man, how do you have that behavior?" And I got into coaching from there. I kind of sparked, and I said, "Maybe I have something here. Maybe I can turn it into something." And from then on, you know, we, we went on to win national championship my fourth year, NCAA champions, and I got an opportunity to come back and play. Uh, Mark Dos Santos and Andrew Olivieri, you know, hooked me up with an opportunity at Lac Saint Louis Soccer for a uh, for a coaching position. Uh, and at the same time, I was playing with the attack. And at the same time, I was after year one of playing with the attack, I, I tried again with the impact. Um, ended up playing playing only on the reserve team. And my career ended there, but my coaching career already had begun full time. So from Lac St. Louis, I moved on to Barassa as technical director. From Barassa, I got an opportunity at Soccer Quebec. Uh, from Soccer Quebec, I, I ended up getting a, a position or accepting a position in Manitoba, believe it or not. I lived in Winnipeg for 11 months, TD, TD of the province, technical director of the province. And from there, I, um, I accepted a job back again through... Uh, through the great friendship I have with Andrew Olivier, he, he helped me come back to, to Quebec uh, through ARS Lanaudière, and now I work at Soccer Quebec again. So it's a long history, and I know nice. I, just spoke, I just spoke for nine minutes already, but that's, uh, that's, that's it. That's what it is. It's, this is about you, my friend. Yeah. It's not, it's not uh, Milan, Milan, Milan Weekly Park. Is me the echo? I don't hear an echo. I hear an echo. I don't know where the echo is coming from. Okay, maybe it's better now. So, like I said there, Mike, you know, for us, it, it, it's a pleasure to have you on because you are from the grassroots, right? Uh, uh, especially for me, someone who's played with RDP, you know, never never yeah. took it to the level uh, that you did, you know, uh, and I've said this to all the guests, you know, that I've had on, uh, not only uh, not only because of its RDP, it's, it's Montreal, right? Uh, yeah. I, I love my city, I love my province, uh, especially when the, my guest is a Milanist, I love you even more. <laughs> and and I want people to know, you know, about about Mike Vituano, the soccer, the, the 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 people that are very heavily involved in soccer will know Mike Vitulano. But I think uh, it's important and it's a platform, you know, uh, you know, uh, for guys like you, Marco. Uh, Rocco, Jason, uh, you know, to have a little bit of a platform, maybe not the most serious platform, guys. Let's no. let's be face it, but but uh, at least somewhere where you could become human and and you can tell tell your story without saying, you know, he's talking about uh, all the good things he did. No, these we have to encourage the guys like you that are from Quebec and from Montreal to to take it to that next level because whether we like it or not, it's guys like you, Marco, Jason, Rocco that are the future. So uh, don't thank us. We thank you. And, and mm -hmm. I want to, you mentioned them quite a bit, of, uh, quite a couple of times there. Andrew is someone that I went to school with, uh, proud of him as well. Um, 
Uh, and I thank him because he's the one who introduced me to you, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 he put us in contact, and it's because of Andrew that you're on here. So, uh, I like to give credit where credit is due. Plus, he's gonna be have like a, he's gonna have a smile from uh, ear to ear that we mentioned him on Milan Weekly podcast, right? Oh, good, good. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit uh, a little bit about the playing career because I like to touch that uh, that topic with uh, with guys like you. Because you can give valuable information not only to players that aspire, but also manage the expectations of the parents, right? So yeah. uh, we all know that it's not uh, it's not an easy journey to go pro. Uh, look, you, you just said it, right? In a span of a tackle, you got up and you felt something in your knee, and your 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 kind of your career takes a little bit of a of a U-turn, right? Can you talk to 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 everybody who's listening about that journey? Uh, you know, you leaving home, especially you leaving home to go to uh, New Hampshire to to take on this scholarship and and what it did what it did to you what it did for your family and uh, just for you in general I, I, what positives did you take out of it look uh, I'll, I'll begin with I made I made lifelong friends like guys guys and and girls from from all over the world that that I can say are my friends now do we do we talk on a daily basis no but during this uh, this COVID period, we we did a few Zoom meetings with everybody, and you 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 start off as if it was ten years ago when we graduated, you know, or or the national championship we won. We we had a reunion uh, a couple of years ago. It was our ten year reunion. We were inducted in the Hall of Fame of the school and of the NE ten Northeast ten. So those are moments that you you are only possible if you built relationships during my journey, right? So. Man, it was tough though. My parents, I remember again, like it was yesterday, my parents driving me uh, early August for preseason. And and uh, I think they they dropped me off. They started balling. I started balling. They they looped around campus, came back to hug me again. They started balling. I started balling. Like it was difficult because we're not used to it as, I guess, as Italians in our culture to to leave home, you know, yeah. unless unless you get married or unless you, uh, you stay there your whole life. So it, it was a, a little bit difficult, but... I was always uh, a little bit um, autonome, like I, I, I do stuff on my own and um, I was a bit older. Most Americans will go to university at 18 years old. I was already turning 21, so I was, you know, and plus I was I was legal age of, of drinking, so that helps all that. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but uh, I have another story for you, Steve, but it, we have to take that story offline though. Nope. <laughs> um, so yeah, look, it was great to be away and you know you start preseason and you're man the hardships you you said about being open and speaking about hardships i had hardships and challenges during my my four years there not only injuries but you know preseason i was never used to a preseason like i lived there and my coach was dutch he was a dutch influence he was from holland and he studied in the u.s became a coach and and so on when a very successful coach marco kuhlman and Preseason was uh, running the loop, and the route the loop was three miles, and you had to do it in in about uh, 18, eight, 3.5 miles in eighteen minutes. And if wow. you don't do it in eighteen minutes, you have seven a.m. practice before the ten a.m. practice. Like it was a bit of that that mentality. And I must admit, he was very open minded, so it changed along the years. A preseason became different in year two, in year three, and year four. But um, maybe it's because I I let him know a few times that it wasn't acceptable. But yeah, man, after that loop that we ran, first practice. I couldn't walk for two weeks. But when I say I couldn't walk, I could not walk. Like physically, I was stuck and I couldn't train. I was one of the worst, like in history, the worst preseason player in that school's history for sure. Yeah, but, um, and, and, and it's funny you touch on that. Like people have to remember that you're alone, right? So there, yes, you can pick up the phone and you can call home or you can call a friend. But once that phone call hangs up, you're alone again, right? Yes, you have a roommate, but no one's gonna understand like your your friends, uh, your friends understand, or your 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 girlfriend or your family, whatever situation you're in, they're never gonna understand that, right? And 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 that's something that you know, like uh, myself too, I try to like uh, let people understand that there is hardships it's not all glory it's not uh, yeah. it's not all uh, just because you sign that uh, you know you, you sign that contract to have a scholarship at the school they can as easy as they gave it to you is as easy as they can take it away so you know not only are you in school but you're also playing as well so uh, what do you tell what do you tell the parents uh, that you know they're trying to live their dream through their kids they think that their kid is the next 
uh, Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, and uh, and they're trying to live their dream through 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 their kid. Yeah, I, I tell them that under understanding the development of a of a player, a soccer player, is extremely complex. Like no players develop the same way. And and my example concretely is I only made a Quebec team at U17, not even looked at 13, 14, 15, 16. At U17, I, is the first time I made a Quebec team. And from there, I was able to, let's say, amplify my, my, my talent or my, my, um, my baggage yeah. to, to really take it to the next level. I played my whole life with Jason. Jason was above everybody else. There was Jason and there was the rest of the crew. And it was, it was clear it was exceptional. It was clear it was going somewhere. And, but unfortunately, those players are rare. Yeah. The, the rest of us, that are good, hardworking players that are intelligent that that need to need to compensate in different ways to show that they're a top level. Need to attract coaches in different ways. And for me, that pressure that's that's put on players, young players these days, as of the age of nine, in my opinion, it's it's ridiculous because it's a ch he's a child. He, he or she is a child, and they, they should live childhood and they should play multiple sports. And and yes, they should accumulate hours and and play soccer. I, I agree with that. Um, but at the end of the day, we're, we're in an amateur system. If a player is that good, we have a system, which is the Montreal Impact Academy, who can now at 13, 14 and so on, take exceptional players. We have the Quebec teams, uh, to take exceptional players, but to be forceful with their kid. I remember having a conversation, a tough one with my dad about at the age of 15, 16, you know, when you start speaking up a little bit more to, yeah. to your parents. And I said, pa, like, it's enough. Like, if, if you keep pushing me like this, and he, he wasn't one of the worst ones, but if you keep pushing me like this, I might just stop. So imagine I had stopped. My life wouldn't be what it is today. I, I'd be working somewhere else, which is completely fine. Yeah. But uh, I wouldn't be in soccer, maybe. So, yeah, maybe not. Maybe you say completely fine. But, you know, I've been there and not in soccer, but in somewhere else. When you're doing something that you don't like, it's not just somewhere else, right? Yeah. Uh, your path and uh, was the soccer one, uh, and and you know you said you had that hard conversation with your with your dad. And not all kids can have that conversation with their parents. Some parents are more receptive than others. That's I come it. from the old school, right? My parents immigrated here. My dad, he he knew how to work. He knew how to come home, and every now and then would drive me to soccer. But mm. he had a different. He had a different. He didn't know the different paths that could have been taken, right? Him, he looked at it as my son, which, you know what, at the time is hard, but you kind of thank them after a while. Like maybe you don't have it to, to make it to that level. Maybe you should concentrate on something else. And that honesty nowadays is is very hard for parents to to wrap their head around because you never want to tell your kid that. But we need to get back to that as a society because you're, you're, you might be pushing your kid in, in a direction that he doesn't want to go. And you might be pushing your kid uh, to make a decision that he doesn't want to make. Right. So uh, I, I commend you for that. Like me, my dad was like, look, uh, Steve, too much uh, <laughs> you, you eat too much. You, you cannot, you, you don't have it. And, and you know what, in the end, he was kind of right. Right. Uh, the soccer programs were different back then. Absolutely. It wasn't it, it wasn't uh, as as a, as advanced or as they are advancing today. So it was hard. You had to really stand out, and you had to really. But there was never that option for the for for the education street, right? So the, the that option to say, you know what, maybe you might not be able to make a pro. But maybe you can get an education out of it, and that's yeah. one hell of a payday, right? Because we all know how much schools cost in uh, in the states, and it's not only the cost; it's that experience, like you said, being on your own, being independent, learning how to do things on your own, uh, living life, meeting people, different cultures. You know, would you ever have met someone, a coach from Holland? Probably through your path, you would have probably met one. Uh, but you, you had the opportunity to meet one very young in your soccer career. And I'm pretty sure uh, th that's a mentor for you. But before before we go on, I have Steve, uh, I have Joe here. He wants me, uh, if you see the question there, he's like, Steve, can you please ask Mike <laughs> about our Canadian National Championship that was won in 1998? How could you just leave that out, Joe? 
I tell you all the time, if you watch the show, Steve does not prepare. I'm gonna, I don't prepare because I want it to be as genuine as possible. I thank you, Joe, for bringing it up because that's my question to uh, Mike right now. Talk to us about your journey about the Canadian Nationals. Man, what, what a squad we had. And Joe Bujemi on the squad, myself, James Piro, Jason DiTullio, Steve Montagna, Jonathan LaFleur, Vino Enrico, Alfredo Musacchio, like, you name them, they they, they they were on the squad. And uh, I'm leaving some out, and I apologize if, if they're listening. But what a group. Like, we, we were the type, Steve, and I think you remember, we were two years or three years younger than you. and Yeah, two years younger. Two years younger, and we were the type that, you know, like, yeah, you know, we had a good coach, but we dictated what we wanted to do. Like, when it came in, in Quebec within the province, you know, and, and then if Jason decided to turn it on, we're like, okay, guys, let's let's follow. And, and we would just be down 4-0 and win games 5-4 and uh we were one of those teams and and that year we went to um we we win uh quebec cup we, we go to nationals and it snowed out so we're, we're in uh, saskatchewan and it snowed out so the tournament stops and we only resumed the tournament um in uh in edmonton the following the following year and we played in a three-way three-way tournament and we ended up winning so for rdp it was i know the senior team was was quite successful at nationals uh, a yep. few times the Condores, yep. but uh, I love saying Condores. But uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah, it was good. 1998, right? We were we were young guys, young U15, and uh, what an experience! But the group of guys, it's like uh, Jonathan Lafleur was was at my house not too long ago, and he, he you know he has a tattoo on his leg, and the, the, these are emotions that like me and Jason. If we see each other, when we see each other, we we it's easy to talk about, you know, because it's. Moments that will stay with uh, with you for the rest of your life. So yeah, because it's a bond, right? And and that's what some some people are starting to forget about about soccer. You're building this bond. You're building this team. You're building this com camaraderie. And like you said, friends that you'll see uh, you'll see. Uh, Maybe not as often because life takes us uh, in in yeah. multiple directions. But when you meet the, when you meet up with a Jason or a Jonathan, uh, that conversation is easy, right? Uh, uh, it's basically, guys, th this is unforgettable. There's something, there's some situation, there's one night, there's one, uh, there's yeah. one stupid event that you probably can't talk about on this on this podcast that that you guys are gonna laugh about and and, and uh, or start remembering bits and pieces of the game, right? So, and again, that's another for the for the the youngsters if uh, that are listening. The Canadian Nationals is a, is a, is a, is a great tournament to go to because you're starting to play against other provinces right for mm -hmm. that uh, for that uh, that championship that you know for for a, a full calendar year till they play it again you're the Canadian national champions yeah it's so, exposure uh, for sure yeah, and it's exposure to the to the city and uh, and it's uh, into the province, right? So thank you, Joe. And Joe is apologizing because he doesn't want to he doesn't want to be banned from the podcast. He's apologizing. <laughs> it was not towards you, Steve. Don't worry, Joe. We're very loose here. Uh, <laughs> uh, everything goes. Trust me, everything goes. So uh, we talked about you as a player. We talked about you. Uh, making that that switch to the, the the coaching let's talk a little bit local soccer uh when uh at your time at uh, at club level at uh, lac saint louis and then uh, again how school kind of prepared you to take that td role in manitoba yeah so look i, I did a degree in the us uh in in uh, media production and graphic design so i'm i'm nowhere using that degree right but I think what school and everybody knows is what school does is it it, it makes you you know better organized, better uh, understanding of I guess of, for me technology and uh, with my colleagues for from work and for, in the soccer community I, I'm I'm known for someone who's very good with uh, powerpoints like let's say maybe not Andrew Olivieri level but I'm I'm, I'm close <laughs> um, but so I guess school helped me with all this this baggage so when I got into that job at Lake Saint Louis the first coaching job where you're a coordinator. So yes, there's coaching on, on weeknights and there's, there's, we were coaching the Lakers back then uh, with Andrew and, and Dwight. And, um, but, but if not, it's organizing, it's creating programs, it's communicating well with parents, it's, it's managing emails. So these things you learn through, through education. Um, and I'm not saying it's the only way to learn it. There's, you, know, you can learn just on your own, but it, it kind of led me that, that pathway. So 
you know, from one job, I, I guess I did well with Lac Saint Louis. Barassa had an opening as as the director because Lac Saint Louis I was the assistant, and it was a no brainer to go to go take that small region and try to bring some new ideas to it. Um, from there, so I never worked for a soccer club. I always stayed in 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 a region environment okay. where there's multiple clubs underneath, and uh, I never had that experience to actually work for a club. And then from there, Quebec soccer, and you know the 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 email came in from uh, from Manitoba Soccer, and and uh, Hector Vergara sent me an email and saying, "Look, you know, we, we we'd like to uh, to see if you'd be interested for this job. We we're we we've heard your name across the, the the country from other colleagues, and we'd like to see if you're interested." So, you know, I had a conversation with my wife, and it it was a tough decision. It was the second time that I was leaving home, right? Yeah, and it's not easy. And um, my wife had a little bit of a harder time with it. We tried to adapt while we were there. Um, things went went okay, and I, I met fantastic people in Manitoba. But um, I guess it wasn't the right fit. I, I didn't feel like I, I could stay there a bit longer term, so I, I preferred to cut it sooner than later and come back home and uh, you know be with our families and 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 try to move on from there. And again, I'm grateful for opportunity that was given to me to come back and, and yeah, and have a yeah, because you know you don't always get that second chance, right? Yeah. Uh, and and, uh, and again, it speaks to you as a person and how it, and and again, a life lesson for everybody. And I don't know, I don't want to seem like someone who's going to give life lessons, but I think it's important that even you know uh, when you're leaving somewhere, leave on good terms, right? And awesome. and and keep the, keep that bridge, right? Uh, can you speak to us a little bit about the difference between, let's say, uh, Manitoba and the way they run things there, and the way we look at things here in Quebec? Uh, well, look, in terms of number, of, just number of members in Quebec, we're looking at about 160,000 members. That includes coaches and players. In Manitoba, we're looking at 13,000. So there's a massive difference, and everything there is concentrated around Winnipeg. And there's only uh, there was it only six clubs, and the, the staff was working well, and they're still working well today. Chris Lorenko and Adam Mui to expand that. Now there's a ninth, uh, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth club in in Manitoba, so they're slowly slowly expanding. Uh, in Quebec, you know, Quebec soccer has been around for a hundred years, 110 or 120 years now. So obviously, it's highly, it's much, it's much more developed, and um, we have a, a lot more people to deal with, coaches to deal with. We have 220 clubs, uh, if you count, count all the tiny clubs that are in Quebec. If not, it's roughly 170. But it's it's a lot of clubs to, to manage, and um, it's a whole different challenge. It's a whole different challenge. Obviously, we have more resources that come with it, but it's it's a different world. It's um, And Quebec, you know, we're, we're known for very competitive people. I think hockey in Manitoba was still very, very strong. Um, and... In Quebec, like soccer is taking a lot of popularity with the impact and and um, and the structures lately. You know, you mentioned earlier when we grew up, we didn't have all these academy programs. Saturday morning, uh, Scuola Calcio. We didn't have all these extra programs. We had no. RDP, and some of us knew about Quebec teams because they happened to get an email. But th this these days, there's so much you can go to. There's individual training. There's training in twos. There's 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 everything right there's physical training for soccer so yeah it's it's really it's really come a, a long way uh from from when i played that's for sure and from when you played we're the same we're kind of the same age yeah. i might look 10 years older than you but i'm not that much older than you that's because i shaved this morning <laughs> <laughs> i'm going with this uh, it, uh, it keeps the mystique uh <laughs> So yeah, like you said, you know, like there's there's so many things that are out there, you know, uh, for the player. What I want to ask you now is I want to go into the coaching, uh, the coaching atmosphere. There we talk so much about what's there for the player. Let's dip into what what options or what things are out there for aspiring coaches. And I'm not saying uh, someone who's played a long time and uh, and uh, he's uh, he he wants to switch to coaching. I'm talking about coaching. In general, uh, someone who's like me, who's been in soccer, loves soccer, and wants to progress and maybe make an impact in uh, in in soccer for his club, let's say RDP or whatever it may be, to the parent who just needs to volunteer and needs to and needs to needs to know a little bit of soccer. There's no soccer for dummies, right? Uh, yeah. uh, there's no book out there, right? So what 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 does Soccer Quebec put in place for these types of these these drastic scenarios yeah so there 
There's what we call community courses. Community courses are, are simple workshops, you know, one day or two day or even half a day for some of them, depending on the age group that you want to coach. But we clubs clubs welcome parents uh, to, 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 you know, to, to be on the field with their with their kids. But it also demands a certain commitment. Uh, and oftentimes parents aren't aren't able to commit for every night. And so what a lot of clubs are doing now are they're turning towards uh, ex players that have played the game uh, that maybe have a better understanding and that want to get into into soccer. And by ex players, it can be, you know, as old as us or even older, but even uh, even young, young lads or, or ladies like that want to at the age of 19, 20, they're playing, they're in school. They want a little part time gig, you know, coaching kids there's those more and more there's those opportunities now there's different level clubs in in the province so some are able to maybe uh you know pay an honorarium for for your participation as a coach for the year some uh, don't um but you know there's there's definitely opportunity and 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 i say it in every uh in every workshop that i do every course that i give whether it's the c license or even the, the higher level the b license uh, but mostly for those community workshop when i used to do it more I do it much less now. I used to thank the people in the course because they're they're giving time on the weekend to come to a two day course, eight hours, eight hours, to listen to me, to exchange with other coaches, to learn. But that, that's it's not something they want to do for a living, right? We have a different pathway for those coaches that wanna that wanna reach high level. So I thank them. I thank them because they give countless amount of hours. I think about my brother who coaches his son uh, at a local club, and it's a. Uh, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time and he enjoys it. He enjoys being on the field and he's calling me for tips and he, he, he's, he's constantly trying to make himself better. But I can see in his lifestyle that he's putting a lot of time and we have to appreciate that. And that goes for thousands of others in the province. So I think our system have to, has to be grateful for it. Like if you compare it to Europe, that, that's not the reality they have there. They, they're able through the pro, the pro club, they're able to hire uh, high level coaches for, for the grassroots, for the young kids. Um, for us, it's a different reality. So we need to be, you know, oftentimes I hear clubs saying, oh, we don't want to talk to parents and we're slowly changing that mentality. We need to talk to parents. We need to get them involved in the process. We need to educate them more about what it, what soccer is about and how we develop young kids and what's the best practices around the world to develop them. Yeah, no, for sure. Well said. Uh, and, you know, you touched on something. It's uh, It has to start from the club level, right? The club the club level, club, regional, and, uh, and, and going upwards to look at these parents and, and say, you know what? Maybe we should be giving something back, right? We should be looking at, uh, at something to attract to attract some more high level, uh, high level coaches back into, in, back into the club. Yeah. Uh, and that, of course, it's all budget and monetary stuff and boring bullshit that I don't want to get into. But uh, for me, what, what the important point is, is that the club needs to recognize certain parents. You know, like the way there's a path for uh, a player to make it to that impact academy, I think the impact academy need to set something up where they should they, they should have a path for an aspiring coach. They should have a path for an aspiring coach to make it to that academy. Uh because there's not enough out there. Then there's not enough uh, of these guys who want to give that that commitment that you said. Because at a certain point, it becomes too much. It yeah. becomes too much to juggle that 40-hour, 50-hour job. Then give you the rest of your time to, to to the club. Where sometimes that club will not reciprocate that respect or that time that you're giving them. Right. So uh, let's let's just be honest. That's that's it's a good majority of the of the of the, the the situations out there and i think if if the impact tries to do to to be to to create some kind of model like that where they they can start picking even coaches instead of just players just to give people a chance you know jason x player that's fine uh there's there's a there's a there's a natural and an organic path for him right yeah. but what about that guy who did not play for the impact how does he get noticed yeah, so the the thing with, with the Montreal Impact is they're limited in in one in resources, but in amount of teams and opportunities, right? So they have you know academy teams. We're looking at I don't know four or five teams from U13 to U19, and then they have the pre academy for coaches. Uh, I think I think they do a a good job with with recruiting coaches, but there's missing there's more coaches out there than just those few opportunities. There's more opportunities than that, you know. Um, 
I'd like to, and we've had these conversations already with, with Philippe Lafroy and the staff, I'd like to create opportunities where we create a bit of a stage, you know, a stage for aspiring coaches to go follow Jason or the, or the U19s with Philippe Lafroy, Jason with the 17s, and maybe for a few sessions or even a few weeks, um, just just to see how, how it works and how it is. And you, you learn from that knowledge the same way, you know, some of us do stages, go to Europe for a week or 10 days and sit with a club and kind of learn, take notes. And it's the same idea, but we have a pro club in our, in our backyard. So th these are relationships that we, you know, we've started to, to, um, to work on Quebec soccer with, uh, with the impact, but the, 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 the issue is always time and resources. That's the issue because we're all caught in our day to day and, and we're, we're trying to plan so many things and, like you just mentioned before, worrying about all the parents and the grassroots coaches, that's already one massive dossier. Now we're looking at, you know, the C license coaches and the next level coaches. And I, I say it all the time. There's, there's a bit of a miss of uh, missing of an, an opportunity. Yeah. The coaches that, that have done well, that, that have gone really far in, in coaching, uh, you know, Andrew Olivieri, who's with the national team now, did the women's program now is the men's program. Um, Marto Santos, Phil Dos Santos, They've, in all three cases, they've took, taken risks. They, they went and work for, for an organization that's outside of this province. And there's many more that, that I'm leaving out. But, uh, you know, Andrea Di Pietrantonio, which, which you, you mentioned, he... Coach. They, they coach, yeah. They took, they took risks to, to go work in San Francisco. And, and that, there's not so many opportunities. So I think with the CPL... You know, if Montreal ever gets a, a franchise CPL or two, oh franchise, yes, yes, that was flying yes, because yes, because that's my next question. Why does Montreal not have a team there? Oh, Montreal, I'm not sure, but why does Quebec, the province? At Quebec, least sorry, yeah, it's Quebec, Quebec. I got excited there. I got excited. Uh, yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> I know. Look, I know Quebec City. Um, th there's rumors out there, and they're they're public, so I, I I don't mind sharing. But there's rumors out there that Quebec City might have a team in, in the near future. I don't know what near future is exactly, but yeah. um, hopefully within two years, because the same way there's a gap for players, there's a gap for, for coaches. And it's like we during this, this COVID period, this pandemic period, a lot of us uh, followed uh, or, sorry, watched webinars from all over the world, Bel Belgium FA, English FA. We even had a, uh, um, a chat with the Napoli um, second coach Gianpaolo Sarini wow uh, two of us and we you know you, you hear them speak about their model of play and and the way they work and uh, you know even the Belgium the, the Belgium TD and you you look and you say man we're, we're not far but we don't have the opportunity to kind of put it in practice we don't have maybe the experience yet because we never coached a pro team because we only have one Yeah, there's only one. Well, there's only one big seat in the in the province, right? Exactly. Uh, and 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 you know what? That's we've touched upon that on on all the all the podcasts with all the guests that we had. That's what people have to understand. There's one big seat in the province, and that's the one that pays. Uh, the rest of the the rest of the coaches out there, you, you guys have to you know you have to be uh, creative in what you do and how you you share that knowledge. And you know again. It's fantastic that you think about uh, about a stage program. That's that's an awesome idea. I think that will be beneficial to a lot of a lot of up and coming coaches. And uh, we have to remember that you know there's someone who's going to have to coach these players. There could be a lot of exceptional players, but there's someone somewhere who has to take that uh, that responsibility to guide these these young kids. Uh, women or, or or men in in that in that right direction, right? So yeah. uh, amazing, amazing. So, what is uh, if you could talk a little bit? And it, this is going to be a little bit of a selfish selfish uh, question. Um, the licenses, so uh, license C, license B, and uh, whatever license there is after that. Can you talk to the people that are listening about these different licenses and what 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 Quebec soccer needs from its its coaches, right? Yeah, so so Canada Soccer over the last two years, I've redesigned the pathway for coaches. There's there's two uh, streams. There's one stream that's the community, the one I mentioned earlier. So those are smaller courses, you know, weekend courses. Some modules are online, and you do a little practical part. It's mostly to coach, you know, grassroots when you're starting as a coach. But then there's the licensing stream. So that you would you would start with the C license, which is a four day course. Where you come in, it's, it's a little bit, I call it the, you know, fun, foundations of coaching, uh, where you learn about principles of play, methodology on the field, 
understanding how to design a practice plan, all these things that are that are going to use that you're going to build tools as a coach. It, we're not talking about systems and tactics yet. We're just talking about methodology and how to interact, how to ask questions to a kid, you know, because coaching is not just yelling. You know, I call it playing PlayStation on the sideline. That's not coaching. Turn left, do this. That's not coaching. Coaching is how to make a kid reflect and how to make him a part of the process, right? That's that's what we want to get into uh, the learning the learning process. So after the C license, what's interesting what Canada Soccer did is they developed three avenues. There's one avenue for the five to 12 year olds, which is called the children license. So it's okay. a nine, nine day course. Wow. For, it's like an A license, but for coaching children, where now you're getting a little bit more in details about what's development for, for young kids. So typically who's going to take these courses? And we've delivered one in 2019 and we're in the middle of de delivering two because it's a year long, three times, three days course. Typically who's going to take that course is a TD. TD of a club because he's going to take the course and now he's going to be able to spread the word on how to develop young kids um, in the club. Then there's a second uh, avenue, which is the youth license, which is a brand new license. We actually just launched it in Quebec yesterday with two groups. Uh, 46 TDs and coaches are, are following it. But again, these are leaders of their clubs that are following from all over Quebec. This is for 13 to 17 year olds. So again, this is a 15 day course. So over about 12 months to 15 months, and it's an A license for youth. So now you get into depth about what's the role of a fullback? What's the role of a center back in different formations? How do you understand systems? How do you per periodize youth development in your club? Uh, how do you understand the mental game for, for a 13-year-old versus a 17-year-old, which is completely different, right? I remember being a 13-year-old myself, shy, shy, wouldn't say much. And then by 16, 17, Oh, now all of a sudden, who's this guy? He's, he's talking all of a sudden, you know, like you, you change. Yeah. But some 13 year olds are loud mouths, right? So everybody's different. Every, we're, we're human. And, and that's the beauty of it is the same way uh, humans are different. Tactics for everyone are different. There's no right or wrong answer. There's everybody can bring their, their model of play. So finally, to finish on the pathway, there's the, the third one, which is C license into the B license, into the A license, and eventually Canada soccer starting with the CPL coaches, maybe you want to start a pro license, which has never existed before. Okay. Um, for me, I, I have an A license. It's about seven years now, I, six years. I, I should renew it because there's a renewal process as well. Um, I, I help Canada Soccer deliver the youth license and the children license uh, as, a, as an instructor. So I learn a lot too by delivering these courses. I learn a lot about my mindset about grassroots coaching since I've been delivering the children license has shifted a lot, you know, with all the research that goes around the world on how to develop young kids and, you know, how to, how to really take them to the next level and keep more kids in the game long term because they can either become pros or, or semi pros like I did or, or, or become coaches. But if a lot of kids quit the game because there's that pressure factor from, like you mentioned, Steve, parents, coaches, and, and their exterior world is putting pressure on them. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, we talk about this different. Can you lose a license? Let's say you have a C license. Can you lose it? Can you, Does it expire? Well, we, Canada Soccer asks that you renew it every five years renew. or okay. you at least take another course in the next okay. in the five years. And like and make, make up for that make up for that difference you have to continuously uh develop, yourself. On, develop yourself with the with yeah. the thing no that, that's what, smart. What, that's smart. what we do in quebec is every year for the because we have our own licenses too for quebec we have uh, what we call uh it used to be called the dep now it's called esp educator de soccer provincial it's a content that i i created with a work group of of guys that uh, you know i trust that i i know spend a lot of time on the field and we took, we made this content into something different than the C, the B license, or the youth, or and the children. We made it specific to Quebec, because in Quebec we have sportitudes, which yep. is completely different than everywhere else in the country. Um, we speak about match managing, which we don't really speak about in the C license or the B license. We speak about um, standards of a player and the model of play, especially the model of play of Quebec soccer. So people that come in the course, they know when a kid would go, one of their players would go to Quebec soccer for a Quebec team or the CNHP, well, this is the way we expect them to play. So it's a special course with all the coaches. There's about 800 coaches in Quebec that have that course. Once a year, we organize a seminar 
uh, for the last two years, we did it in um, in uh, Saint Saint in a big conference hall, 700 coaches in a room. The first year we did it there, John Herdman with his staff came and presented to everybody about the national team. And the second year now, we had the French, uh, uh, Sil- uh, what's his name? I forget his name now. Um, Guy something. <laughs> Guy Stéphane. He's the assistant coach of the French national team that won the World Cup. Wow. He was with us because we have a partnership with, with the FFF. Uh, Wilfred Nancy was was presenting. AJ Woodburn from the University of Laval. Like I did different subject. It was a little bit like a choose choose the the workshop you want to go to throughout the day, and you you go wherever you want, but you have to sign up for it first. You know, so that's a way to renew your license and oh, to cool. renew your your permit and you know refresh on. Uh, and now there's some coaches Steve that show up, and it's like okay, another one of these days. Let me just show up because I have to. Uh, and then there's the ones that just love it and they're, they're there, they're learning and they're ready to absorb. Yeah. And, and, um, I give you an example with Johan Dame. Johan Dame used to be with the Montreal Impact Academy, uh, maybe a little stint with the pro team at some point, but he, he's now coaching assistant coach in uh, Cincinnati, FC Cincinnati in, in wow. the, the MLS. And he came for last year's stage and, and he texted me and says, you know, can I pass by? I said, come in. And you're talking about an MLS coach who came yeah. in. Watched uh, watched a presentation about about player development and about uh, psycho- psychology of the of the player. It was a it was a ski coach who I invited to present. He loved it. So it's all the the mindset that you come in to learn. Yeah. If you come in with a mindset that you know everything and that you don't want to listen to anybody, like you have to have an open mindset. And myself as an instructor, and I tell all the instructors that work with and for me. I tell them that you, you, we have to be the first people that have to have an open mindset, right? That, that, that's, that's super, 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 super important. important. This, this dumb, dumb phone. <laughs> What's going on over here? Better, no? Hello? Yeah, I hear we're you. Good, we're good, we're good, we're good. Technical difficulties. I pressed the button on this stupid thing. So uh, to get back to, to, to that there, and, and again, this is why I stressed at the beginning of, and you see, look, 45 minutes just passed just like that. We didn't even, we didn't even touch, uh, I, we're going to touch something special for you. And uh, we didn't touch uh, anything said, yeah. So uh, imagine, guys, guys like Mike give their time and, and they come in and they bring in a fresh new look at things they they the, their box they they look at they're not looking in the box anymore these guys are looking outside the box and this is what we need because the game is changing the the demographics of the j the game is changing speed uh, and athleticism is one thing tactical is another thing mentality is a huge factor huge factor in the game now which you know back when we played we got on the field we played the game we wanted to win. Eh, there was not too much other things that were distracting us. Now there's distractions, right? There's social media. There's uh, yeah. uh, there's the Instagram. There's the Twitter. There's the YouTube live, Facebook live, highlights, flips, and this and that. Guys like you, Mike, are doing a fantastic job with Soccer Quebec. You know, uh, guys like Marco, Rocco, Jason, uh, Andrea. Amazing work with, with thinking out of the box and, you know, reaching out to, to you know, like the French national program, uh, let's, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to disrespect Canada, but we need to learn from federations like that. You know, we need to plug at, at countries that are higher up than us and see what they're doing. It might be beneficial to us in some way, but maybe it opens up, you know, a young guy like you, it gives you another opportunity to see some, a, a different side of the game and like you said as instructors which is, which is great is that you guys are receptive to what you're getting from the people that are attending these uh, seminars right mm-hmm. uh, maybe someone's going to come to you one day and he's going to have a fantastic idea and you're going to use it the next year this is important you know and as soccer quebec and yourself and canada continue to engage with everybody that's how it's going to bring people closer to the game and you know now with their new licensing program and 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 what the regions and the and the clubs have to do at their level to get better you know it's all positive right now right uh, uh, we're going to continue and talking uh, past this but I want to I want to leave local soccer now and I want to talk about something that you know you you failed to 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 uh, to mention and it's not the the national win that you guys had in 1998 <laughs> but uh, it's your time uh, in the women's program because uh, I want to make sure that people understand the women's game is growing uh, very very much so 
And you were a big part of that. And you were a part of uh, that World Cup team with uh, Andrew Olivieri, correct? Uh, well, that was uh, that was the U17 boys. U17. The boys, yeah. Okay, uh, the last, boys. Last you, did, you did not. I thought you were assistant coach with the women's team. No. No, no. No, okay. My mistake. No, the U17 boys. Yeah. How is Soccer Quebec dealing with the women's program and that growth? Because we don't have enough people for the men. What are we doing for the women? Yeah, so it, it's a good question. So um, Canada Soccer has developed, a, a, through John Herdman many years ago, has developed a, a, a whole a whole structure and system across all the provinces. And there's there's regional excellence centers in, in a lot of the provinces. Quebec has one. Um, so on a daily basis, there's young girls between the age of 15 and 17, 18 that come and train at Bois de Boulogne on a daily basis, 150 sessions a year. Um, and there's plans to update that program and how it works. So look, we, we've seen, we've had a lot of, in my opinion, um, for Quebec born girls, we've had a lot of success at the, in terms of placing girls, girls on the national team at the youth level where, where there's, there's a little bit of a, a gap is in those ages of 19, 19 to 23. There's not so many that end up on the, on the first teams of, on the first national team of the women. There's Gabrielle Cal that does. Uh, there's a Jose Belanger at some point um, got through. And there's more that I, I might be missing. But at the youth level, we often place six, seven girls on a, on a U-17 national team or sometimes maybe a bit less on the U-20. But there's a gap. So the gap is, is maybe related to environments possible for these girls to play in. Like at the end of the day, you can train all you want, but you need to compete. At those ages, competition is, is huge. Like you, you need to develop that, that winning attitude, that winning mentality for, for players at 17 to 20, where it's like there's a, it's, it's beyond like development is still important in their, in their pathway, but now you're really pushing to compete and create winners. And I feel that on the women's side, we're, we're missing that a little bit. You know, on the boys' side, we have the Montreal Impact Academy at U19. They had a reserve team. They no longer have a reserve team. Um, I mean, everybody knows it's, it's a touchy subject, but I'll say it. Everybody knows that having a reserve team for the Montreal impact is huge. Yeah. It's, it's necessary. Now we hope that one day it comes back. Uh, CPL is going to be huge. Is there a CPL women that's going to start in the future? Once this starts happening, I think girls are going to get that opportunity. Like right now, girls at 17, 18 have the opportunity to play in the PLSQ, uh, female okay. uh, version of it, you know, a semi-pro championship. It doesn't last very long. And it's a, it's a good competition. There, there's good coaches. Um, but is it enough? You know, is it enough uh, with, with short season for girls to really make that push? But uh, for girls, they have that avenue as well, right? So the NCAA is huge in the, in the girls in girls soccer, right? So uh, and that's a that's a bit of a tough part, right? Because the girl has to make a decision whether she wants to leave home to go continue her soccer career. So what do you what do you say uh for soccer quebec what's that next step for women's soccer is it really they we need our own league in canada for women's soccer to for it to to continue to grow or is it okay that we have our uh, our uh, elite talent go to the states and continue to play in, in the ncaa and uh, again that competition is very uh, very competitive and you, you're you're playing like a tough match every match What's what's the dilemma there? What, what does Soccer Quebec or Soccer Canada think about that? I look if if I had to choose, I think you know from a snap of a fingers, I'd say I'd say a, a CPL women's women's league. But it took it took so many years to create a men's league. Like we're one of the nations, uh, one of FIFA, one of the only FIFA nations who until just now didn't have a, a pro league, right? So uh, for for men, so it, it might take time to. And I know there's work groups. Canada Soccer is working hard with certain people to to get that women's side going and starting with women's events. League One Ontario exists. It's a, uh, for females. It's a semi-pro. PLSQ exists. So we feel like there is there are pools of players. Um, I mean, going to the U.S. for an education and, and playing NCAA is great competition. Like, I lived it. There, besides for playing pro, like, it is a pro environment. Like, you train every day. You know, you just have to manage school at the same time. A pro player will go home and play PlayStation or run his business or do other things. Uh, whereas a, a university player has to go home and study because yeah. he has an exam and an essay to write, and then he's got to go back to training 
uh, later in the day and, and so on. And, but the season in the U.S. is so short. That's one of the knocks on it is that okay. you're playing you're playing 20 some games great it's it's fierce competition great but you're playing from you know September to to late October uh, some some de depending the division the division will play a little longer so imagine players can be in an environment women can be in an environment where they're playing you know close to a year long or or at least six months long in a season and they're managing school uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't have the right the yeah. right answer to there's this. There's no. There's no right answer. Again, mm. it's it's not to, not to put you on the spot. It's just to pick your brain on what yeah. what we can do, right? Because you know, you see uh, you see the different leagues uh, in Europe, right? Uh, popping up the Serie A Women's League. There's the Ligue 1 Women's League, you know, and there's the English Premier League Women's League. So uh, it's important. And again, that's another avenue. For for these girls to take right, but again, a huge step for them to 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 move across uh, across the ocean to go play soccer professionally there. And of course, it's a dream, but it, it's a big decision, right? So uh, amazing with with women's soccer, you know. And I'm a big advocate of that. Uh, you know, Forza Milan, le ragazze, the 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 diavoline, they yeah. have to uh, they have to uh, they have to bring back some glory too in this in this club, right? So. Yeah. Uh, Let's go to that uh, just before we go to the fun stuff. I want to know about your time with uh, the Canadian national team uh, coaching that uh, U17 team. Yeah, so well look, my my first my first international experience as a, as a coach was actually with the futsal national team. Yes, I, I apologize. I wanted to touch futsal too. Okay, well sorry if I brought it up, but um in 2016 we we went to uh, CONCACAF qualification. Wow. And uh that was the first time that, you know, I, I coached as an assistant coach, but I coached in an international match and it was an eye opener. Like it, it, futsal is a different sport. Obviously it's, it's completely uh, different. Um, but it was, it was great to see, you know, the organization, every, how everything is, is, is set for, for these high level teams, international teams to compete. So that was a great experience. And then, you know, coming back to Quebec and, um, and, and, Andrew Olivieri again gave me the opportunity to be his assistant coach uh, with Jason Ditulio with the U20s. We did we did a um, qualifications for Concacaf for the U20s in uh, October or November 2018, and then um, I stayed along on on the staff for the U17. Andrew was also the head coach for the U17, and what a journey it was! Like where 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 we were able to take these kids from you know our first camp in Mexico in, in early March. 2019 through qualifications in Florida and qualifying for the World Cup through a camp in Montreal through preparation in Argentina right before going to Brazil and then you know drawing Brazil for ma opening match I remember texting, <laughs> Andrew, texting Andrew and I'm like watch this we're gonna get slot A2 and when you get A2 you're playing the host which is yeah. A1 in an opening match and we're like oh man we, we fell on A2 opening match 15,000 people in Brasilia and um it was unbelievable so the national me working with andrew and the national teams and you know getting opportunities to interact with john herdman and and other staffs like Mauro and and jason it it opens up my mind to saying man like my own personal conviction about the game has evolved so much and it's still going to keep evolving and and the national team and the, the the way they work and the way they interact with players and you know i saw it live on how we were able to take players to another level and it's just gratifying to see players now uh, signing, you know, Keyshawn Ferdinand, young, he was 15 when he came to the World Cup with us. He just signed a pro contract with Montreal Impact. I think it Good was for yesterday. Him. Good with, for him. Uh, with Tommy Geraldo as well. So a bunch of players from Vancouver, TFC, uh, signing pro contracts. Like, it means a lot, you know. So, you know, about the World Cup, it's it was a hell of an experience. You know, it's organized by FIFA, so it's, it's top-notch and getting to live those matches and seeing my, my own personal development over, you know, from the futsal first experience to international matches uh, to a world cup is like, it's a dream come true. And, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunities and hopefully, you know, I keep, I keep working towards them, but uh, it's, it's crazy. Amazing, man. Amazing. Amazing that you guys, you know, uh, uh, you, you got that experience and, you know, you, you, your guys, your local guys here from Quebec, who can uh, continue to uh, 
to pass on that knowledge to the the other coaches that are coming up you know and that's on your pedigree and that's on your uh, and that's on your your resume for life right so uh, uh, and it's a must be an amazing feeling as a, as a young coach to see uh, uh, to see these players develop and sign pro contracts and you know and as time will go It'll, it'll be outside of MLS or maybe the journey will take them from MLS somewhere else. You know, whatever that journey will be, you know, you had an impact on this kid's life. And I bet that if someone interviews him, yeah, maybe it's going to be Milan Weekly Podcast. You never know. He's going to yeah. mention, you know, Mike Vitulano was a huge, uh, was a huge uh, Mike Vitulano, Andrew Olivier, Jason Dettulli were a huge part of my uh, development, right? And that's that's the the ultimate prize for, for a coach, man. Uh, and and I like to, Steve, I like to believe that because we're not all going to coach the future pro player. So yeah. what I tell coaches in courses is we should also take pride in in the guy that played played under you until the age of I don't know 18 years old and went on to school and opened the business and is super successful or became a, a plumber and is successful, became an engineer. Like it doesn't matter what it is. Hopefully we in sport had an impact on on their lives and that's I think for me that's that's valuable and when someone is successful banker these days and I'm I'm still proud to have coached him of course, of course. because like, hopefully there's values that we were able to transmit because it's not true we're going to develop all future pro players it's no, no talking about that, less than a percent you know exactly less than a percent ladies and gentlemen it's the second time on this show i hope parents you're listening it's less than a percent it's not to be condescending it's here on milan weekly podcast we like to tell you the truth uh less than a percent guys let that sink in and you know what if your kid can take it uh, take soccer to uh, to a level where they can get schooling that's great if your kid could take uh, soccer to where he has respect for his parents and uh, his grandparents and everybody around for him that's amazing and you know and be a better person because in the end you know and soccer made me a better person right i was able to interact with so many people that you know i still see today and you know they, of course they give me the same uh, the, the, it's always the same line steve uh, you're putting on some weight there eh? and th that's normal right but it's it's a laugh and we go back and we and we reminisce like you said you know not at, not at your level but we reminisce about smaller games but still uh, again a bond is formed there and and these kids uh, nowadays unfortunately with electronics it seems like we're losing that bond right so they have to remember that uh, the the organized sports is what's going to bring it back right so that's amazing uh we're not we're an hour in ladies and gentlemen i like i hope that you're you're you're, you're enjoying this because i can't believe again uh an hour passes so fast we're gonna yeah. talk we're gonna talk some serious stuff now we're gonna talk about our beloved milan ladies and gentlemen mike tell us how you became a milan fan tell milan weekly podcast nation how you've loved and you bleed these uh, red and black colors yeah it's it's look it's it's from my dad my dad you know, I remember being a young kid. I, I, I don't remember so much, but mid those mid nineties with Maldini, Baresi, the Desai, I, I kind of remember that and you know, getting close to 10 years old there. And um yeah, the, those were the colors. Oddly enough, my, my brother was an Inter fan, which which I never older than me, yeah. uh, which which <laughs> was uh, <laughs> which was odd, but uh I guess he was doing it out of spite, but I don't know. Um so yeah, from then on, and really where I, where I, I got captivated is in those very late late nineties and early two thousands. Uh, I think the jersey is actually from the two thousand ed edition, two thousand two thousand one. Yeah, that you think of Boban, you think of Bierhoff, you look at the the Opel guys, right? Uh, yeah. Of course, Maldini, the Albertini, of course. But Milan, you know, for 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 me. Uh, it, I really loved it, and especially now, you know, like you, it, it's sad because Serie A is taking a little bit of a, a step back in, in in the way they're they're doing things, and they're not marketing the game properly. And of course, I say this all the time. People who have listened to the podcast; they know uh, they're missing that North American market, right? I remember when I was playing, you know, and I'm pretty sure when you were playing. You know, that's all we would talk about. We would talk yeah. about the Italian teams, you understand? And there was great players, guys, you know? Everybody tells me, you know, Steve, my son likes Barcelona because of Messi. I'm saying, you know, that's a lie because I could have chose any other team. I, I chose, you know, uh, my, my dad liked Juve. I was not going to become Juve. It so happened I was uh, uh, I became a Milanist. It's a long story. You'll, you'll, I'll, I'll keep it for another time, Mikey. But... Now we hear the Messi's, we hear the Ronaldo's, you know, and those, and it's fine, and it's a fine conversation, and I get it, right? But 
where Serie A is losing a bit of that lackluster, you know? So, uh, l- l- hypothetical question. If you would be, uh, let's say, uh, a, power, a, p- a position of power in Serie A, what does Serie A need to do so that, you know, my kids, your kids are going to start talking about Serie A again? I, I completely agree with your, your your comment of before of th- that that whole marketing side of things, and I think I think Juve took with the new stadium took took that part like they they kind of were able to 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 get their, their, their... they botched it, Mikey. They botched it. They made it too small. Oh, well, that that's a different story. But, <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, like the Juve brand, because of the stadium, because of I guess the, the experience. Uh, and I never, you've been to San Siro, I suppose. I've never been. I have never been to San Siro. And I'd love to go. Um, is there rumors that they were, they were about, they want to build a new stadium? Yeah, yeah. so that's, that, that was going to be, a, it's funny uh, you talked about that. I was going to talk about that after. Okay. What do you think about that? But as two guys who never went there, now our mission is to go to San Siro. Yeah, let's do it, man. Let's get yeah, the whole You know, so, so like, uh, uh, again, again, I, I would like to pick your brain because of your background in marketing. Because of you know uh, you're a really educated guy, uh, you're, you're not because not because you're on my podcast, but you know you're you're full of you're full of ideas and full of uh, of really out of the box uh, out of the box um, solutions. What can Seria do just to to say you know what let's let's inject some 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 more attention not only to the Juve because Juve seems to have taken their own steps without Seria. What yeah. does Seria need to do as a league? Yeah, that's look. It, it, it's a great question. Uh, as a league, uh, I don't know. You know, you think about th- this day and age, TV deals. Uh, I don't know. Like it, the MLS. Obviously, we live in the in North America, but the MLS feels like there, there's a there's a marketing thing going behind it. The Serie A, it still feels like it's a, it's it's just the it, it's just another league in Europe. Yeah. You know, whereas you're right in those early two thousands, in the nineties. Like it was, it was the go-to league. It was the go-to. It was the standard. Now people are talking more about the Bundesliga. I don't know. Is it? A, is it? Is it top-level players? Maybe. I mean, Ronaldo plays there, so he he should bring a little bit of that. You know, I I think there's more North Americans that watch uh, Serie A now because of, of 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 superstars, just like Ronaldo. I I suppose. Uh, so is it attracting more players? Because the coaching is good. Most coaches are obviously all Italian, but the coaches are. Or um, or yeah. quality technically and uh, technically and and what they do on the field and what they what they want to bring, it, it's still there. You like you know everybody says I go to Serie A to get my my university degree in coaching. You know, mm-hmm. and and a coach needs to pass through that. You know, uh, a Mourinho has come. You know, Ancelotti who's who's my in my personal opinion he's my favorite. He's my uh, uh, my favorite coach. Um, the thing with Serie A, Mike, is 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 exactly what you you touched upon, right? Like so, a league like the Bundesliga, they they fell into some trouble too. You know, Germany had to rework their whole program, and one of the things that came out of that is like we need to get more eyeballs on this league, and you know they they have a little bit of a problem too, where Bayern Munich is 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 running that league the same way as Juve is, but what's different is. They have a humongous deal with Fox to get their their uh, to get the North American eyeballs on on the Bundesliga. Serie A doesn't have that, and what frustrates me is you know like uh, again w- w- dating myself and aging myself. 1990 and 2000, I remember with my friends, you know, uh, we had uh, Venire Romanista. We had uh, we had someone who was in uh, Francis Colla Giacomo di Interista. We, uh, myself, of course, uh, you know, it's uh, Milanista, Juventin, and we would talk and we would argue like old men. It's it's losing that lackluster because there's not a lot of arguments. You understand? A league cannot be run eight or nine straight scudettos by one team, and and that has to do a bit. You know, and, and again, I'm gonna say it because it, it's the de- de- deservedly so. Juventus took advantage of all the other teams falling asleep at the wheel. Not only all the other teams falling asleep at the wheel, I think they also took their league falling asleep at the wheel. So yeah. they went to the new stadium way. And again, it's hurting the league a lot, right? And it's it's making it's making me have that difficult conversation where I don't want to see my kid, to be very honest with you, and I don't want to be uh, uh, self-centered. My kid, <laughs> he has he has a choice. It's gonna be a bit very difficult choice for him if he likes soccer. 
but he knows that I will never give up this black and red color. So he better be, he better be really sure who he's going to be going for. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's talk about Milan. And again, uh, in your career as a coach and as a, as a player, can you give me, you know, just a fast, a fast answers, you know, a player that, uh, that you try to model your game around. Uh, a player that influenced me was, was Zizou. Was Zinedine Zidane? He, I don't know he, that that World Cup in in '98, and he just. My friends and I have these debates all the time. Or who are three players? Who are three athletes that in, inspired you? Uh, for me, it was Michael Jordan growing up, uh, and it's not because of the documentary. It was no, you're in the '90s. You know, you're a Bulls. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was uh, Wayne Gretzky because I, I grew up playing hockey as well, street hockey all the time, and I think it was natural for us to do that. And and Zizou, and th those are three players. Like and the the two thousands with Kaká, I think Kaká is up there. Where you know those rivalries with, Man with Manchester United there in Champions League, where he's he's carrying the team on his back. Like I still have those images vivid in my mind. Uh, so he's up there too. Yeah. And I know his career is is had up and ups and downs with the with the national team or whatnot. But yeah, so I would say Zizou, and he's not a Milan Milan player. You know he no. played. And he doesn't, you know, like if, uh, uh, for me, my favorite player in Serie A has always been Roberto Baggio. Was I really ecstatic and happy when he, when he, he donned that Milan shirt? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. I was, but that's the type of player, not that I try to model my game around, is I had nowhere the talent of that, but I like that Fantasista player. I like that, that Zizou, uh, you know, the touches, the first touch. For me, yeah. that's something that, you know, if I, if I do go, if I do take a coaching thing, it's that. It's one of the things that you have to look at, you know, what's that kid's first touch? Is it mm -hmm. a heavy first touch? How do we fix it? How do we, how do we get him to, to, to use angles properly? Zizou was a, he was like a human geography set. Like yeah. he would touch the ball, his first touch would lead him to a second touch. It's like it's magical and to he's, watch. He was always a step ahead, a, a little bit like Pirlo, right? Pirlo yeah. in the midfield, you know, for Milan, and then later for Juve or for or for the national team. Man, he's he's he, in his head, he's always a, a step or two ahead. So yeah. he doesn't need to be that physical, right? He needs a good surround cast, but he doesn't need to be that physical. But he's thinking ahead, and he says it in his book, right? That everything goes on in here, and he, that's it. So it, it's, it's easier. And again. The calmness, right? You touched yeah. upon the psychology of it, the vision. You know that stuff that it, you can you can lead someone in the right direction, but the vision is not something that's going to be taught. It's something that's going to have to be built, right? You have yeah. to start seeing the game uh, at a different level, right? So, uh, what about coaching? Who influenced you the most in coaching? Uh, there's there's many. Uh... I'll go. I'll go personal here. I'll go. I'll go. Coaches that I actually played for. So Marco Kuman from the U.S. and and then I, I ended up playing a season with the Attack before he moved on to the Montreal Impact. Is is Mark Dos Santos? Like I, playing for him kind of opened up my mind again to how to structure the game and and how to work with with tactics and how to have an identity when when you play. So um, I'll, I'll go local. If you want me to go a, a bit international. No, that's uh, a question. That's a question for another time. That's a question for another yeah. time. Keep you keep that one in the back pocket. Yeah. Back pocket. What about? Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the your 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 most vivid AC Milan memory. It's it's that one about Kaká. Well, Kaka, look, I have Kaka, a bad one. I, I have a really bad one. My my first roommate in the U.S. was Dutch. Uh, uh, yeah. Kai. Kais Robin, that was that was a Robin, and Robin means yeah. red leg, so we used to call him red leg. <laughs> red leg. So after after my first year in the summer, he's like, "Hey, I live in Amsterdam. Why don't you come?" I call for my friend from Montreal. I said, "Hey, Nick, let's go." You know, so we go to Amsterdam. First night we get there. Second night is is uh, the final was in in uh, in Istanbul, the Liverpool game. Yeah, three 0 up. I'm partying, man, and I know I don't want to bring that up because all the Milanese are gonna get mad at me, but. 3-0 up, and it was one of the worst nights <laughs> of my life. But then, you know, a, a few years later, uh, 2000, 2006, you know, winning the 2006 or seven, winning the Champions League and redemption against Liverpool and in, in yeah. that was uh, was a big one. But that, that that Kaka game there, when he's he's weaving through players against Manchester United, is just like for me, it's like it's right there. I don't hear you, Steve. 
my bad sorry i was on mute again technology not for us so yeah kaka is uh is a vivid memory for everybody right because it's someone that we, we we took from brazil and we took a chance on and you know again judging a book by its cover you know even gattuso was quoted saying uh, you know when i first saw him i turned around and i said what is this guy gonna do he's gonna get killed and then once he started to see him play then things started to change, right? So uh, important for all those young coaches out there. Don't judge a book by its cover. You never know what's uh, what's lying inside that uh, that little body or that stringy body. You never know what's going to yeah. come out, right? So yeah, you don't uh, see it. You don't see it. But the jersey is actually signed by uh, Nesta when he was here with Montreal, and, and Gattuso, very nice, Gattuso very nice. Came, uh, came at some point. Remember yeah. for a coaching event? coaching seminar? Yes, yeah. yes. I missed yeah. it. I was away on spring break, and I had to miss it. <laughs> I'm sure you had a good time uh, in spring break. Though. No, I didn't. It was, it was my family. It's over. I have no good times anymore. <laughs> Two kids. Let's talk about Milan player. Your favorite Milan player of all time. Um, I'll go with... Uh, I have to go with Maldini. Yeah, yeah. Maldini. Maldini was... Uh, yeah, look, I, I played. Uh, I played in many positions. I played full back. I played, despite my uh, five foot nine and a bit, I played uh, center back. My last year at university, uh, when we won national champion, I played holding midfield. So I have a bit of that influence of of, uh, of a Pirlo, uh, Maldini. But Maldini was was a, a go to reference as a kid growing up. Like I, I, I loved him. <laughs> Chris just uh, we have a question. Chris just asked which which Milan player did you want to be when you were growing up? You answered it before we got the, the before we got the question in. So Chris uh, for Mike it's Maldini. Yeah, I'd hair like him too, you know, like the whole bandana. Yeah, yeah, with the nice with the shoestring there. Yeah, I never exactly. had that. I never had that. My uh, I could, my dad didn't want me to grow my hair. <laughs> and thank God, look at it now. Uh Mike, let's go to uh, I want to pick your brain about coaching. What's uh, what's your favorite formation? Uh, I, I personally like to to play in a four three three. Obviously, you need the personnel, the, the type of players to play in it. Uh, but but just having you know wide high players causing problems on fullbacks and 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 midfielders plunging in behind. But I think I think a four three three. Then it all depends on how you animate it and how you you bring it to life. Like you can play a very boring four three three, and then you can play a very exciting one. So. Um, but I, I, I like to, to uh, you know, despite my uh, my Catanacho or, or Catanacho culture, I, I like to attack. I like players bombing forward and and taking risks, and you know, obviously with a uh, with intelligence. But yeah, I, I always wanted to ask someone uh, someone this question. You know, I w- I was always someone of the believer that you know you can start with a formation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to end in that formation. Uh, again, of course, circumstances, uh, red cards, and so on and so forth. But the game has a life of its own, right? The game has a, the game is like a chess match. Some coach on the other side, you know, he might have outcoached you for the first fifteen minutes. You're gonna have to make a change. Mm-hmm. How hard is it to make a change in the game? Yeah. Well, first, first of all, you know when they show the formations on the TV and they said that they're playing in this and they're playing in this. Oftentimes, they're they're wrong. Yeah, it's a lie. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not really accurate, and they're trying to piece it together. And uh, again, it comes down to how you animate it. Like you can you can quickly turn a four three three into a three five two just by dropping a midfielder, and and you can you can invert your your wingers to to come in. So there's a lot of different movements you can do to to get that to get those quick changes um in a game it's the thing is you don't want to improvise in a game what i tell coaches all the time is the last thing you want to do is saying you know all season you've worked on a 4-3-3 in different ways um with different ways to animate it and then all of a sudden in a game out of the blue guys go on a 4-4-2 diamond like they're gonna look at you says wait we never like we never worked that players registered with the messages and the the communication and the, the knowledge you give them, the tools you give them. Now they're gonna they're gonna put themselves in that shape, but it doesn't mean they're gonna know exactly the roles and responsibilities. So I try to tell coaches avoid doing that. Stick to what, especially with with uh, you know with youth players, thirteen to to seventeen. Stop inventing. Like the worst I hear it sometimes because I go to the fields and the worst thing is say les gars today on va jouer un trois cinq deux and the kids look at trois cinq deux like okay but. See, we never played with three backs. <laughs> That's not my phone number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I get it at the youth level, but even like 
sometimes I I, I I see some clubs or some teams, you know, like you're struggling on the defensive side. Is it something that's common in the game now where a coach will say, you know what, when you're on the attack, when you're attacking, you'll line up in this formation. But when you defend, let's drop back to this formation. Is there is there that mindset that's that's happening now where the coaches are starting to look at this like, a, uh, again, a bit of, Look, let's play to our strengths when we're attacking, but when we're defending, maybe we, sh we should play to our strengths even more to create this opportunity or X or Y opportunity. A hundred, a hundred percent. That's that's in high level coaching. Uh, it's rare you'll find this is the way we attack and we'll defend in the same way. Like the, there has to be a shift, right? First of all, it's a shift in in attitude in the players, right? Everybody needs to be able to attack, but transition and defend. You you can't have a guy just roaming around. Well, you could if he's exceptional and you build your team around that, but that's a, a whole different subject. Um, in defending, it, it all depends on maybe where you want to defend. So you can be a team who who defends and drops down and parks the bus, like I see in the comments there, or <laughs> you, you can be a team you can be a team that maybe parks their block at halfway line and waits and is patient. Then you can be a team that defends by by going and press high and. It all depends. And, you know, you can't press. It's it's very difficult to press 90 minutes high. You, there's moments in the game that says, okay, guys, drop the line of engagement to midline, relax, and we'll, we'll have more space to attack once we win the ball. Let them come to us. You said it perfectly. And I remember using those words with ex-coaches of mine. They would ask me, what do you describe soccer? And my first words, it's a chess match. Yeah. Chess match. I, I, I really I watch it like that, and that's why I talk about it like that because I like to watch off the ball. It's hard when you're watching TV. I love to watch games. I don't yeah. have the chance. To, I don't have the chance to do it as often as I can. You know, uh, just because of, uh, of of you know uh, work engagement and family engagement. Man, I would love to take a stroll. You know, and watch one of your games or or see when when the Quebec team is playing just to see what you guys are doing. And, and it's that, and it's important because you, you get to see how you guys are breaking down the game. You know, like you said, it, it's impossible if people are thinking that you can press for 90 minutes straight. It, it's just not feasible, and you're setting yourself up for failure. You have to cut the game and pick your pick your, pick your your punches, right? So let's go again back to Serie A. Uh, Mike, w have you been watching Milan lately? Uh, in all honesty, no. Okay, I'll so Milan is a, Milan is in a tough spot, right? So let's uh, let's put on again your marketing cap on, and not not only marketing but soccer Quebec uh, hat on and TD hat and the experience and national team and and if again power position when you have to be in like a soccer Quebec role where you have to give guidance to the to, to, to the, these coaches and these managers, you know. Milan right now, they're struggling on the management side. They're struggling at the ownership side. So imagine for them, Soccer Canada is nowhere to be found. They're not engaged. They're not, they're not on the same page. Uh, you as a coach, how do you manage that, that, that friction that's going on above you uh, and keep your players out of, that, uh, out of that soap opera or that telenovela, like I like calling it? Yeah, so you're absolutely right where everything that's management and above just the team has an incidence on the team. Like uh, you can say all you want, uh, don't worry about that, don't worry about it, but it does have a toll because because of access to communication and access to, to media these days, players can see that, they can see rumors, they can see back in the day, maybe not as much or not nearly as much. So like a message for the players is, is as a coach, as, a, as a, a, a technical director of the club is, you know, let's focus on the things we can control and what we can control is the next 90 minutes, you know, and there's a cliche way of saying it, but then is it's, it's putting it in your culture as well. So by creating a culture with your, with your team and making them believe in that. And if it means you have to get guys, players, coaches, staff out of this culture because they, they want to dare to it, then, then that those are decisions that you have to make as a coach. If, if a player, uh, despite his name and despite his, his talent, doesn't want to get into this culture of this new way of thinking, saying, let's focus on what we can control as a group and how we can make the jersey proud. Let let the owners wor worry about the ownership, the marketing, worry about the marketing, but let's go out there and battle. Like, 
like I said, I, I don't I don't follow it so much right now, and I I should probably do so more. Uh, a little bit for the reasons you mentioned, the Serie A is kind of in my own personal esteem has has dropped a, a little bit. So I, I watch a little bit of other leagues, but um, from what I gather, because I read a lot about it, and is is that Milan could compete. They could compete against against good teams, and they you know they've shown it the other day where they took a bit of a against Juve, they took a bit of a beating at the start, but then got things going and and defended really well. So and they're a fairly young team, so you you can build upon these things. But if you don't have the right apples in the basket and there's some rotten ones, those are decisions you can control as a as a coach and as a as a technical director of the club. So yeah, the, the, the problem the problem with Milan is you, you know you said rotten apples. Right now we don't even have the bag to hold those apples in, or or they're good or they're bad. And it's true, right? Because uh, again, uh, it's a project, right? These 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 these, yeah. these clubs are now their businesses, right? And their branding and their you know look, I, I'm wearing a Milan 120 years. I had to go above and beyond to get this because I want to because I need to, because I love Milan. Yeah. There's not a lot of people like us left, you understand? The, the Milan Club Montreal, it's hard to keep a to keep a, a club like that alive because of because of uh, the digiti- digitization of sports, right? Uh, you can you can watch sports on your on your phone while I'm going to say while you're giving a seminar, no, but mm-hmm. if oh, you're somewhere if you're somewhere and the, and you really want to watch the game, you can watch it on your phone. Yeah. And before, like in your dad's time and my dad's time, if they had to watch a game, they had to they had to go to the bar, right? And this is how those clubs. What, uh, in your opinion, a club like Milan, what does it need to do in terms of engagement with North America? What, do, like again, marketing hat on, right? What can be a small win for a club like Milan to touch North America? Well, you know when they do those those summer tours, and I remember going to a few of those in in the in the U.S. where you go watch a Milan Juve or a uh, Milan. I think at some point Milan Barcelona as well. Yeah, we um, even got to see Milan against the Impact here. That was sensational. Absolutely, Ronaldinho was in that game, and a lot of uh, a lot of our friends played played in that game, which was great. Um, look, I think it, it for me it starts with the league. Like if Milan has to do something, it's it's more of those tours. It's 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 rebranding a little bit of the club, and I'm not saying change logo. That's not what I'm saying. Like Juve do did, but rebranding. You know who are we about? Like create an identity for the club, and the identity is yes, it's on the field. You know, do you want to build with young, talented player? And I, I think Atalanta went a little bit in that direction where they have a lot of you know young, promising players on that team. And but make a decision. Make a decision where you want to go. Like you're, you're, you're right. And I don't know much about it. I'll be honest. But the the analogy of we don't have a bag to hold the apples. Well, that's a massive problem, right? It's so, a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And what it causes you is to drop a lot of apples. And those apples, as much as uh, the the many times that you drop them, start to get a little bit pissed off. And it causes a negative a negative feel for that club, that player, that young and up and coming talent needs to make a decision now. Am I going to go play at this problem club or am I going to take my chance with the Parma, the Atalanta, the Sassuolo, the smaller, more developmental clubs? And I'm no, no disrespect to them. It's just, unfortunately, Serie A is built that way. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem with Milan, right? So it's it's, 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 it's hurting me. It's hurting me. So I'm going to have, I have like, I'm not going to take much more of your time again, guys, um, an hour and a half. Yeah. It's really amazing. So this went crazy fast and yeah. we're going to have Mike on again for sure. We're going to probably make him the, the, an honorary member of Milan club Montreal, or he's going to come and pay the $40 and, oh, wow. <laughs> I need and, and bring your dad, bring your yeah, dad. Will, too. We want all the members, you know, so, uh, uh, again, Mike, thank you. Before we go, though, I want I, I want to just give you these five. You know, just really, they could be stupid. One word answer. That's all I want. Uh, rapid fire questions. Okay. The one you have one game to win. You need to put a coach in that position to win you that one game. Who's it going to be? Um, Conte. Oh yeah, Tony yeah. Toupe. You're going to put in there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> You have a penalty shot. 
You need to give it to someone. Who are you going to give it to? Any player in the world, right? Yeah, of course. Oh, Messi. Messi. I want to know if you were a technical director of, again, we're going to say sporting club of your choice. And you need to, to, to pick a key position where you want to upgrade on, let's say, we're going to pick Milan. We're going to look at Milan now, the way they are now, young and up and coming. You need to upgrade, upgrade between, you have three options. You can either upgrade at the back, one of the defensive line, in the middle, or at striker. Where are you making that upgrade? Where's the most impact you think that's gonna that, that, that's gonna that's gonna give? Striker. It's, Striker. It's, it's the most difficult it difficult job. Yeah? Oh man. More than a center back. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I played I, I played center back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, like strikers, man. Strikers are um it's it's tough. It's, it's tough. It, 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 you have to be cut cut from a different cloth to be one of those top 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 striker yeah, you're, right you're dealing with like you're you're dealing with multiple defenders you're dealing with not a lot of space like a center back on the ball will have space but a striker uh, it's 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 a whole different craft nice interesting last one it's my signature question penne lisce or penne rigate no definitely rigate yeah <laughs> <laughs> Mike, thank you very much. Mike, before we go, please yeah. tell everybody how they can follow you. Uh, and, and you know, this is the time where you tell people what you what your final words are on uh, Milan Weekly Podcast for tonight. Well, first off, thanks a lot, Steve. It was a, it was a blast. I, I, I enjoyed talking to you. And anytime you want me back on for, for different subjects, I'm always, I'm always game. Uh, look, you can reach me via Twitter, mvtulano. It's at the bottom of the screen there. V two L A N O, um, Twitter, Instagram. I don't use much. I use it to follow the tweet, the, the tweets. But uh, or or by email, you know, on Quebec Soccer website, you can you can reach me if you have questions about coaching. Steve, I'm I'm definitely gonna get you in a in an XC license. That's for sure. We'll talk about. That. <laughs> you know what? We'll I might we'll I, I might um I I think I might have one. Uh, you have to check for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, look. If anybody wants to reach out with questions about coaching development, about player development. I'm, I'm always open to that. And people know that I, I like to give my time and, and try to contribute to, to not only just a few players, but the whole system. Like I, I want this to work, work well for, for Quebec, for the, the country. And I, I want to do, I want us to do well in a, in a world cup in the future. So that's, that's the, the objective. Excellent. Mike, thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Milan Weekly Podcast. We, po we post everywhere. Uh, we're going to even start maybe probably mailing some letters soon. Uh, we love having local guys on. We love having. We love talking stuff outside of Serie A as well with these special podcasts. Uh, you know, Mike has been a great guest. Thank you, everybody. Guys, we are the English voice of Radio Rossonera, believe it or not. Mike's going to end up on a podcast in some nonna's kitchen tomorrow <laughs> and uh, and she'll know a little bit about uh, Quebec and Canadian soccer. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And uh, please stay safe, stay uh, cool, and Forza Milan. Forza Milan. Ciao. Ciao.